Hello. All set? Uh, yeah, I you can start, Bob. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, this is my first Zoom talk, so it's uh, good to know that uh, what I can look forward to when I start teaching on Zoom next week, uh, technical problems and all sorts of things. So it's a great pleasure to be talking to you today. And I wanna really highlight today the work of two extraordinary scientists, Sue Fay, a current postdoc in my lab and Tristan Bell who finished up his PhD uh, late last year. And the subject of today's talk is CLIP-XP. It's a protease and it functions in quality control and protein remodeling in bacteria and eukaryotic mitochondria and uh, chloroplasts. Uh, we have, for example, in our mitochondria, a CLIP-XP homologue. In E. coli, which is the model system I work on, uh, E. coli CLIP-XP degrades uh, proteins that are tagged by what's called the SSRA system. And that adds a sequence uh, shown here, an 11 residue sequence to the end of proteins whose translation can't continue normally on the ribosome. And so it allows both releases the ribosome and puts this degradation tag. And we showed a long time ago that one of the proteases that recognizes this SSRA tag is CLIP-XP. So CLIP-XP is shown here in cartoon form. This is sort of the, our understanding of the system uh, circa 2004. It's still pretty much right. CLIP-X is a hexameric uh, ATP dependent on foldase. CLIP-P is a self-compartmentalized peptidase with the active sites inside a barrel. And substrates, protein substrates bind to CLIP-X via sort of uh, tags or degrons, usually at the N-terminus or the C-terminus. The SSRA tag is a C-terminal tag. It binds in this axial channel of CLIP-X. And then in the process that we're still trying to understand in molecular detail, uh, CLIP-X grabs a substrate, pulls on it, unfolds the polypeptide, and then translocates it into the uh, lumen of the protease for degradation. And any partially synthesized protein in E. coli can be SSRA tagged. Um, so there are sort of 5,000 plus possible SSRA substrates in E. coli alone in multiple different reading frames. And then there are other degrons that target things. So this is not a case of one enzyme, one substrate. It's one enzyme, many substrates. And the CLIPX monomer has three domains. It's got an N-terminal domain that we usually cut off because it's not necessary for degradation or recognition of SSRA uh, tag proteins and it limits solubility. Then it's got a traditional AAA module consisting of a large domain and a small domain. And this large domain and small domain have all the sort of motifs that one's come to expect of AAA proteins, Walker A, Walker B, uh, arch finger motifs, et cetera. Um, POR1, POR2, and RKH loops are involved in substrate binding, as I'll uh, tell you a little bit later. And then this IGF uh, motif is specific for enzymes like CLIPX that interact with CLIPP. Um, CLIPX functions as a ring hexamer. And for simplicity in my lab, we often, in fact, cut off the end domain and stitch together six uh, different AAA modules to make a pseudohexamer that allows us to mutate individual subunits in the pseudohexamer for genetic uh, studies. So we got into the cryo-EM game about uh, two and a half, three years ago, and Sue has now solved uh, six cryo-EM structures of CLIP-XP bound to protein substrates. And the two I'm gonna sort of focus on today were obtained using green fluorescent protein with a 20 residue degron that has an SSRA tag at its end. And for these structures, we sort of uh, vitrified the samples very quickly after adding substrate to CLIPX in the presence of a mixture of ATP and ATP gamma S. ATP gamma S is hydrolyzed by CLIPX, but slowly. And what that allowed us to do is to get bound structures very early in the process. Uh, we have four additional structures, including the one shown here. Uh, the substrate is shown in orange here. CLIPX is always shown in some sort of yellowish color, uh, or CLIP-P in yellowish color, CLIPX in uh, various shades of purple, cyan, blue, et cetera. Um, and in fact, 
this structure came from a clip X prep that we didn't add substrate to. So the substrate either came along with it during the purification or it's part of clip X or clip P that's being cannibalized. So the subunits of clip X in all of our structures form a shallow spiral. And that's true of virtually all AAA proteases and protein remodeling machines whose structures are now known. And we label the subunits A through F, A being the highest subunit, F being the lowest subunit. And in this uh, diagram, I've simply taken away one of the subunits so you can see uh, in space filling here, the polypeptide of a substrate built as a polyalanine chain sitting in the axial channel. So this is really the holy grail for us. This is the first structure in which we could see a specific degron bound to clip X. It's the SSRA degron of this GFP substrate I described to you. Again, this is clip X here. Here's the degron in space filling, clip P down here. And you can see that the degron is bound in the top part of the axial channel of, of clip X. And here's the density for the um, uh, degron. And the density is unambiguous and ends right down here where the alpha carboxylate is. So we can see very clearly what's going on in this complex, which we call a recognition complex. And in this complex, basically, again, I'm showing the SSRA degron and space filling clip X residues in ball and stick with um, sort of, uh, what do you call these, uh, space filling uh, dots around them. And the most intimate contacts with the degron are made with this alanine and this alanine at the C terminus. This is the alpha carboxylate down here. And these contacts are made by a set of pore one, pore two, and RKH loops at the top of the channel, as I said before. And interestingly, the channel is actually blocked by this pore two loop of subunit A. So all other structures that we've seen and other people have seen in AAAs have open channels. Uh, this has a blocked channel and part of the blockade is part of the recognition of the SSRA tag. So why do we call this a recognition complex? How do we know it's not something else? Well, the best evidence is probably that we know that these two alanines in the alpha carboxylate at the end of the SSRA tag are really important for degradation. If, for example, we mutate uh, the c terminal carboxylate to a carboxamide, if we change the, um, either of the two uh, c terminal alanines to other residues, we get large decreases in KMs, almost no changes in Vmax. And that's essentially what you'd expect if recognition is sensitive to side chain uh, size and charge, which you'd expect. Um, there's a series of pore loops that make these contacts. These residues listed at the top here all make specific amino acid contacts with the SSRA tag in the recognition complex. And again, if you mutate these residues in clip X, typically to alanine or uh, some conservative substitution, uh, you get a large increase in KM uh, without seeing much of a change in Vmax. So again, the degradation experiments using mutant SSRA degrounds or mutant clip Xs really strongly support the, the assignment of this cryo-M structure as a recognition complex. The other thing that this complex does is it explains some old experiments that we'd done years ago, which had implicated the RKH loops and the PORE2 loops of clip X in substrate specificity. We didn't know at the time how that was occurring, but the RC, the recognition complex structure, provides a molecular rationale for this. So E. coli clip X, as I've told you, recognizes and degrades proteins with the SSRA tag. Human clip X doesn't. On the other hand, human clip X has the same pore one loop and it differs in its pore two loops only at two critical residues here and here. And in the late, in about 2008, I think Andy Martin found that if we transplanted the pore two and the RKH loop from E. coli clip X into the human, we now got recognition and degradation of SSRA tag substrates whereas human by itself, human with just one with the RKH loop of E. coli or human with the PORE2 loop didn't. So again, this recognition complex structure now tells us why that's the case, because again, these two critical residues in the PORE2 and the RKH loops are 
required for recognition of the tag. This is an old, another old experiment done in 2008 by Chris Farrell, a graduate student. And what he found is if you just take this arginine, the arch loop and change it to alanine and look at degradation of arc, which is a small DNA binding protein with an SSRA tag or the same protein, but with an N-terminal recognition sequence, wild type degrades both of them, but the KM is lower for the SSRA tag than for the lambda O tag. But when you make this simple substitution, you reverse those two. And if you look at specificity as defined by the Vmax over KM, the single substitution is changing specificity by about 400 fold. So that suggests to us that really specificity of our enzyme is an evolutionary compromise that's not optimized for any single substrate, but instead allows recognition of, of multiple classes of, of substrates. So here's another complex that Sue got uh, with the, again, GFP with the 20 residue degron. And now the SSRA degron has moved six residues deeper into the axial pore. The channel is now open instead of closed. And again, the side chain density uh, for, the, for the tag is unambiguous uh, once again. So we're really certain where this is. And this is the first case, I think, in any AAA uh, protease or remodeling machine where one's been able to recognize a particular sequence in two different locations in the pore. And in our case, the difference in those, uh, those uh, locations is six residues. This is the inter what we call the intermediate complex. And what you can see is that there are many more contacts between clip X and the degron now. These contacts are largely made by pore one loops and subunits B through F, that's the lower part of the channel. Remember in the recognition complex, all the contacts were made at, at the top. In fact, pore two loops of only subunits A and B were interacting with the substrate there. And this structure actually resembles structures of lots of AAA proteases and remodeling machines with polypeptides in the pore. Um, and the channel is open and this is sort of thought to be a translocation competent uh, structure. What you can see is that there's lots of room for the side chains to differ. For example, that alanine down there, there's room for a longer side chain without any steric clashes. So unlike the recognition complex, it really looks like side chain variation uh, is almost infinitely possible in this kind of structure. So here's a model for what we think is going on with this particular substrate with its 20 residue degron. Again, we think that initially we're binding in this recognition complex where the channel's closed and only sort of four or five, uh, six residues of the degron are interacting with clip X. Then we think there's a translocation step that moves the uh, polypeptide six residues deeper into the channel. So this is the first structure I showed you. This is the second structure I showed you. This intermediate complex I told you is very similar to these translocation complexes that we see with ClipX and other people see with lots of related proteins. And we think unfolding occurs from what we would call the engaged complex where now the part of GFP is pulled tightly against the top of clip X so that you can actually generate an unfolding force when you try to translocate. We don't have this particular structure with GFP, but this is the structure I showed you before. Again, it's an unknown substrate pulled tight against the top of the, the clip X axial pore. So traditionally in these kind of things, what you do is you sort of take your different structures and you put them in order and you say, this is the way it works. We wanted to check that by some sort of standard biophysical methods. So we wanted to ask whether we could actually detect, for example, different kinds of substrate bound complexes. So we used a substrate called Titan, which unfolding is very slow. We put a single fluorescent dye on the clip X hexamer. And then we labeled a Titan SSRA substrate with a black hole quencher so we could do rapid kinetics. And then we fit the kinetic data, both association and dissociation, basically to the first four steps of this model. And what you can see in the association is you get a very fast binding. 
And then you get a slower phase of binding. And then you get a third binding phase, which actually the fluorescence goes up a bit until you hit steady state. And these are different concentrations of associations in the presence of ATP. If you do the same thing with ATP gamma S, which clip X hydrolyzes more slowly, the first phase is essentially the same. It's not ATP hydrolysis dependent. The later phases all slow down. They are dependent on the rate of hydrolysis. And again, we can fit the dissociation kinetics in ATP and ATP gamma S to the exact same model and get rate constants for all these uh, steps. So the polyphasic association and dissociation connects fit well to this sort of model that initially came from our structures. So specific recognition really contrasts, contrasts enormously with promiscuous translocation. And during translocation, Clipex really doesn't care about polypeptide chemistry at all. And what I mean by that is translocation can go in either the C to the N-terminal or the N to the C-terminal direction. Side chain chirality doesn't matter. D amino acids are translocated fine. Polyproline's translocated, so there's no need for a peptide in H group. Uh, long tracts of glycine, arginine, glutamate, et cetera, are translocated, so you don't need variation uh, in the amino acid sequence. And surprisingly, you don't even need a normal spacing between peptide bonds. This is a, a, a substrate that we made that's got 10 additional methylene groups between peptide bonds, and ClipXP was able to translocate this just fine. So again, this comes back to the model I showed you before. And in the model I showed you before, we said unfolding is occurring at this step. That is after the, the folded part of the protein is pulled tight against the top of clip X by multiple translocation steps. And again, I said in this recognition complex, there's only a couple poor loops interacting with clip X, whereas in these structures, there's multiple poor loops from five different subunits interacting. So the question is, do you have to have multiple poor loops interacting to get unfolding? Or could you unfold from this kind of structure if you had a short enough tag? And so Tristan basically did this experiment and he shortened the tag and asked, if we have a very short tag, can we get unfolding? And the results were really clear. So he made tags of three, five, seven, nine, and 11 residues. The 11 residues is the full SSRA tag. If you have three residues, you get no degradation at all. As soon as you have five or more, you get robust degradation. So we conclude from this that a power stroke from this recognition complex where you only have a few pore loops at the top of the pore interacting with clip X is unfolding competent. And this is simply a model we took we made in which we took GFP with a five residue degron, just the last five residues of the SSRA tag, Y-A-L-A-A, -A -A, and modeled it based on Sue's recognition complex to see if we'd get a good fit. And you get a beautiful fit uh, with no steric clashes. If you try to model just an LAA, a three residue degron, then the degron is too short to reach the contacts in the pore without severe steric classes. So probably five or more residues are required for recognition. So I wanna talk about a concept we call grip. Um, if you're a rock climber like this fairly fit fellow, it doesn't really matter how strong your shoulders or arms are. If you're gonna pull yourself up this cliff the small grip of your fingers on a very short ledge has to be tight enough to in fact maintain the force to allow you to pull yourself up. And the same is true of clip X. Since clip X is pulling down on a substrate, Newton tells us the substrate is pulling back uh, with an equal and opposite force. And at some point, these contacts between the polypeptide and the loops in the axial pore have to be tight enough so that we don't get slippage. And so the question is, what are the molecular determinants of a good grip? And Tristan studied this problem by first 
discovering that if we put 12 glycines between GFP and an SSRA tag, then Clipex couldn't degrade this substrate at all. It recognizes it just fine because it's got an SSRA tag, but it can't actually pull on the folded part tightly enough to unfold the GFP barrel. So then once he found that, he said, well, let's just put a single tyrosine in this stretch of 12 glycines and ask, can we rescue degradation? And the results were spectacular as shown down here. Tyrosine at one does nothing. Tyrosines at two through six give you this nice Gaussian distribution. Tyrosines at seven and eight, again, do nothing. So that says as there's a very narrow window here at this part of the tag, close to clip X, where grip is occurring. If we take residue four, which is the place where tyrosine gives us the best grip, and put all 20 amino acids there, then it turns out that large branch hydrophobic residues are the best, aromatics, et cetera. Small positively charged and negatively charged residues are the worst. And this is my favorite pair. Here's a threonine and a valine, which are isosteric. Valine is gripped and degraded really well. Threonine is barely degraded at all. So like recognition, unlike translocation, grip is highly dependent on the chemical properties of the side chains. So one question is why do clipex contacts higher in the channel contribute more to substrate grip? And the simple answer is we have no idea, but here's a couple ideas. Here's the 12 residue degron with the tyrosine at position four. Here's just our Y-A-L-A-A -A -A short SSRA degron. And one possibility is that the RKH and POR1 loops both contact the substrate high in the channel. And that might rigidify the contact synergistically and allow you to hold on tighter. The other possibility is that when you apply force higher in the channels, there's less chance of it being dissipated by elastic stretching of the substrate polypeptide. So either of these ideas is possible or something we haven't thought of yet. So this focus so far has been on ClipX, but ClipP is also obviously an essential part of the ClipXP protease. I just want to say a few things about ClipP. So ClipP is made of two heptameric rings, so seven subunits per ring. ClipX, remember, is a spiral hexamer. So we have a symmetry mismatch between the two. And as we suspected for a long time, that symmetry mismatch is mediated by flexible loops. At the end of these flexible loops, there's this isoleucine glycine phenylalanine or IGF sequence. And these sequences dock into sort of hydrophobic clefts, six hydrophobic clefts on the surface of clip P. Uh, so we could have a clip hex, X hexamer up here. We could have another one down here. And if we align the folded parts or the, the sort of conserved parts of the triple, large AAA domain up here, and then say, what happens to the IGF loops? You can see they're in all sorts of different positions. And that's just means that they're flexible and can adopt multiple conformations. And what that allows you to do is basically make a symmetry mismatch between, again, a hexameric spiral and a flat heptameric ring. Since there's seven clefts in clip X and only six IGF loops, there's obviously an empty channel, an empty cleft. It's right here. And in all of the structures we've done and structures that the Toronto group has done, the empty channel is almost all, or the empty cleft is almost always, it is always between subunits E and F. That is the lowest two subunits um, in the clip X hexamer. And as I'll tell you later on, lots of people believe that clip X and similar enzymes work by a sequential mechanism in which every subunit passes through every position in the spiral. If that were the case, and the empty cleft was always between the lowest two positions in the spiral, then clip X would rotate with respect to clip P. We don't think that occurs because we can cross-link clip X to clip P and it doesn't prevent degradation. We can do the same thing with the clip AP complex, again, where there's a heptamer hexamer mismatch and cross-linking there doesn't block degradation. 
So I want to talk a little bit about single molecule optical trapping because that's taught us quite a bit about substrate unfolding and translocation. And this is just the standard uh, double bead setup, two laser trap beads. We have clip XP attached to one bead, a multi-domain substrate attached to the other bead. When clip X finds a folded domain and unfolds it, the distance between the bead gets longer. When it translocates, the distance gets shorter comes to the next domain, you wait while it tries to unfold it, then you unfold. And that gives you these soft tra trajectories in which nothing happens for a while. You get an unfolding trajectory, you get a translocation trajectory, another unfolding dwell, unfolding, et cetera. And the length of these unfolding dwells tell us how hard it is uh, for clip X or how long it takes for clip X to in fact unfold the substrate. So again, this is the Titan I-27 domain, a beta sheet domain. And what's really interesting here is if you put the SSRI tag on the C terminus, where it normally would be, then you get unfolding, you get translocation, and then you get long dwells with an average of about 55 seconds before the next unfolding event. And so this is translocation here, that's unfolding. So you can see that unfolding is the slow step in degradation here. This is exactly the same substrate, but now we've put the SSRA tag at the end terminus via disulfide bond. Now you get unfolding, translocation, immediately get unfolding again, translocation, unfolding. So now unfolding is about 60 times faster. And now translocation is the slow step in degradation. So again, this is the same protein, the same thermodynamic, the same kinetic stability, and so what that tells you is that ClipX cares about the mechanical stability of the protein, not the thermodynamic uh, or the global kinetic uh, stability of the protein. So if we measure the unfolding dwell times and plot them, they give us a nice exponential. That tells us that one ATP hydrolysis event causes denaturation. Um, but we also know that the, the length of the time required for let's say Titan unfolding, hundreds of ATPs can be hydrolyzed before unfolding occurs. So that suggests that most power strokes fail, probably as a consequence of loss of grip. We think that unfolding of stable substrates requires coincident pulling by clip X and stochastic thermal destabilization of the part of the protein you're pulling on, whether it's the N terminus or the C terminus. And then we also imagine that natural degradation tags evolve at the protein terminus from which unfolding is easier. So it's really hard to unfold from the, from the C terminus. It makes more sense for nature to put a few residues at the end terminus uh, to allow it to be degraded when degradation is required in the cell. So again, over the last three or four years, probably now 50 or so cryo-EM structures of AAA machines with bound protein substrate have been determined by multiple groups all over the world. And there's sort of been a consensus model that's been proposed based on these structures uh, in different uh, nucleotide states. Again, these are all spirals, just like clip X is a spiral. Here I've just unwound the spiral. So the top of the spiral would be this subunit, the bottom of the subunit would be this subunit. And the orthodox model that most people believe in basically says something like, you always get hydrolysis by a single subunit in the spiral. In this case, subunit E is hydrolyzing ATP to ADP. Once that occurs, you get a resetting of the spiral in which the top five subunits move down one position, the bottom subunit moves up to the top. And doing that, you move the substrate two amino acids down in the channel. And two amino acids is is the distance between uh, sequential pore loops in all of these structures. So only one subunit hydrolyzes DNA, hydrolysis and subunit movement is sequential, each power stroke translocates two residues. And this is a fine model, it just doesn't support it at all by our CLIPEX experiments. And I'll go through a few of those for you. So this again is an old experiment done by Andy Martin in 2005. And we're using our single chain ClipX molecules to go in and surgically oblate ATP hydrolysis in either four 
or five subunits, or we have a wild type that's got six ATP active uh, subunits. And then we're measuring degradation of a substrate. What you can see is even if you only have one active subunit, you still get degradation. It's pretty weak, it's pretty pathetic, it's pretty slow, but it works. If you have two active subunits on the other hand, opposed from each other, you get degradation at about a third the rate of wild type. And what's really impressive is this degradation has exactly the same thermodynamic efficiency. So it's, it uses exactly the same number of ATPs to unfold and translocate a substrate as this does. And to us, that's, that kind of behavior just precludes any sort of strictly sequential model that says that subunits have to fire one after the other. And we suggested at the time that there was some probabilistic uh, uh, element to clip X where different subunits in the ring, depending on, on let's say substrate contacts or something else could hydrolyze ATP and set off a, a power stroke. This is single optical, uh, single molecule optical trapping, looking at the translocation uh, steps of um, clip XP. And this is uh, from experiments we did with Matt Lang, Carlos Bustamani and Andy Martin at Berkeley did similar experiments. And basically what you find is you get different translocation steps. Some are longer, some are shorter. Um, on average for clip X, the translocation step is about two nanometers in length. The orthodox model predicts it should be about 0.6 nanometers down here. The other thing what we find and the Berkeley group finds that these steps don't occur in any specific order. So sometimes you get a bunch of short steps together, sometimes longer steps together. And again, this random order of different length steps to us supports a mechanism with at least one probabilistic or stochastic uh, step. So how do we explain then how clip X uh, translocates uh, things with a step size that's basically, we should have said here that the, um, the smallest step we see for clip X is about one nanometer, which at the forces we're using would be five to eight, five to seven amino acids, something like that. So in the optical trap, the polypeptide strain isn't completely stretched out. It's still somewhat compact. All right, so here's a model that takes into account SU structures and our biochemical and biophysical data. And it sort of takes the orthodox model and it turns it around. So again, in this model, we're saying, let's say just to have something to talk about that uh, subunit A hydrolyzes ATP and that sets off a power stroke. But now subunit A is gonna drag the subunit down to the bottom of the spiral and everybody else is gonna move up one. So again, in the orthodox model, everybody moves down one and the bottom guy moves up to the top and we've just reversed that. And this is simply a morph over here of Sue's RC and IC structures showing what we think that would look like to give you a six residue power stroke. And again, subunit A is providing most of the grip uh, of the substrate here, consistent with Tristan's uh, experiments. All right, so this doesn't say, this is still a sequential model, right? You would simply go through this and then repeat it again. And so every position would go through every, you would cycle through every, subunit would cycle through every position in the spiral. But you can imagine uh, other models in which that doesn't happen, but instead you get some sort of reciprocating action that is subunit A pulls down and then moves back up and moves down again, something like that. But this doesn't explain how you get longer translocation steps of two, three, four nanometers, which correspond to 10 to 20 amino acids. This only would give you a power stroke of six residues. So this is a model that would allow rapid step bursts and also allow probabilistic hydrolysis at internal spiral positions. And again, it's a model, so it may be right and it may be wrong. So imagine, for example, that subunit B hydrolyzes ATP to ADP. We don't get a power stroke, but that strains that provides, that creates strain in the spiral. Now subunit C hydrolyzes. Again, that creates additional strain. 
sorry, here's, here's the first guy hydrolyzing, here's the second guy hydrolyzing. Still haven't gotten a power stroke. And now another subunit hydrolyzes and either because it's a specific subunit or because now the strain is more than some limited amount, that sets off a set of three very rapid power strokes. And a model like this can explain why we can actually operate ClipX pretty efficiently with only two wild type subunits able to hydrolyze ATP. It can explain why we get these very fast uh, bursts of kinetic steps. And again, it's consistent with either a, a sequential or a reciprocating model in terms of, of things like that. And the possibility of ATP hydrolysis at internal spiral positions is really supported by the structures that show that the active sites of those are well formed. If I were to show you different active sites in clip A, uh, clip X from subunit A, B, C, D, E, you really couldn't tell which was about to hydrolyze ATP given what the active site looks like in those structures. So that's where we are in terms of this uh, project. Um, here's the summary. Um, these cryo-EM structures Sue has done um, are similar. The, the translocation complexes and intermediate complexes Sue has, they're similar to those of other AAA proteases. Um, they explain promiscuous translocation. Our recognition complex is different from the intermediate complex. It has fewer contacts, higher in the channel, more specific interactions uh, with the poor one, poor two, and RKH loops. And again, it explains the KM and specificity changes caused by mutations. Tristan's results suggest that you can get an unfolding power stroke directly from the recognition complex for GFP, which is one of the most stable, stable substrates that um, protein substrates that these machines can unfold. In contrast to two residue translocation models, the ClipX power stroke moves things about three times longer, can also do it in bursts. And again, we can sort of marry the structures we have uh, to the biochemistry with a set of models that are plausible, but still need to be uh, tested more rigorously. So with that, let me just thank everyone who's been part of this. This has been a long-term collaboration with my colleague, Tanya Baker, the single molecule experiments done with, in collaboration with Matt Lang in his lab. Steve Harrison and Simon Jenny got us going on the cryo-EM. I've sort of highlighted Sue and Tristan's work and a whole set of other postdocs and graduate students or undergraduates over the years have contributed to the story. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Bob, for, for the wonderful talk. Um, and in fact, we already have a number of questions here in the, uh, in the chat window. And um, so the first question is by Stephen Fried. So Stephen, can you un unmute yourself and then ask your question? Brilliant, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, the question that I had, slightly technical in nature, but I'm sort of curious about the, sort of the resolution between the recognition complex and like, I guess maybe what you referred to as like this engaged complex. Yep. Is there any way to like biochemically sort of like pause the system in those two different states or is this just based on class averaging and basically sort of seeing like having everything all mixed together on the grid and then you sort so, of yeah things. so again what we did is we um we added clip xp to substrate and then plunged very rapidly so let's say five seconds Got so it. you know in principle, if we just let it sit there, we would still get some, you know, our, our kinetics suggest that we, we get a distribution of the recognition, the intermediate and gauge complex, but actually the, the, the kinetics suggest that about 80% of those complexes should be the engaged complex. And that's something we're trying to get right now. So I think we've just gotten those two complexes. And again, the recognition and the intermediate complex account for 90% of the particles we see. So we're not picking out small uh, subsets of particles here. Um, and I think they're just the first ones that form and, and we're getting some sort of distribution based on the kinetics with which they form. Perfect, yeah, great, thanks. The next question is by Lila Girash. Yeah, hey Bob, can you hear me? 
Yeah. Um, so that was beautiful, as, as, as usual, but with um, wonderful new stuff. Um, I just wanted to ask about some of what you're learning for the recognition, the fact that you are able to see what you consider to be more specific recognition, and then you see in the translocation complex more promiscuous recognition. In both cases, it looked like the, the substrate is really rather extended. And I was wondering if you see a shift to more backbone groups involved in the actual binding, um, or to what extent in both cases you get some. Uh, we have we have a mixture of we have a mixture of side chain and backbone complex uh, contacts with with both in in both of the specific complexes, but the side chain complexes are as you would expect. Most of the contacts are with the beta carbon, so. Any, anything but polyglycine is going to have a beta carbon. Um, and again, we do see backbone contacts, but, but you know, the fact that we can get translocation of these weird substrates with 10 extra methylenes between things probably suggests that, you know, there's no regular spacing of those. Right. Um, so it, you know, our guess is it's largely adventitious hydrogen bonds with the backbone and van der Waals contacts with the parts of the polypeptide that are common to any amino acid sequence that are driving translocation. Gotcha, thanks. Okay, so next question by uh, James Borderwell. Hey Bob, hey, so Jim. very nice talk as always. So a question about grip. It looked like hydrophobicity and size were very important, but clearly not just size because things like arginine weren't gripped well. So to continue with the mountain climber analogy, one of the most important things in mountain climbing is lack of moisture on your grip surface. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so many mountaineers have died when you know rain or snow has come through. So with the, can you test the model that a little bit of water in between the grip surface might interfere with grip? And you have complicated things going on, of course, because the hydrophobic effect is due to ordering of water and you, you would have to have sort of freezing and microscopic freezing and unthawing of water right near the motion of the grip. So if you have mutants that open up the channel a little bit that let in more water, are they less grippy, for instance? Uh, yeah, if you, um, you know, if you put leucine instead of tyrosine, for example, there, what, what we actually know is that those things unfold things more slowly. We haven't done grip experiments uh, directly except in Tristan's experiment where we can actually look directly at, let's say leucine versus tyrosine at, at, at one position. But it's not, it's not a single position kind of thing. Uh, you know, there's Tristan's experiments I didn't have time to go into show that there's synergy between multiple side chains at different positions. To answer your question, I don't see any way we could actually directly test the hypothesis without changing so many variables that no one would believe the experiment because, you know, we're doing the experiment in DMSO and yeah. the XP doesn't like DMSO or something like that. But it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting idea. Thank you. Gilad, you are the next. Yeah, okay. So uh, thank you, Bob, for this really illuminating talk. Uh, I have a question about the pore loop. So in all the translocation models, orthodox, unorthodox, like yours, uh, the pore loop uh, motion is basically ignored, but the, these are loops. So they probably move quite freely up and down. Is there any role for this motion in your opinion? They they are loops, but the poor one loops are rather stiff. Um, it's only a couple residues between, um, you know, two fairly rigid parts of structure. So they certainly can move. And if you align all the different poor loops that we have in different structures, you see small changes. And we assume that those changes help ClipX adapt to different amino acid sequences. Because if you had something that was completely rigid, you know, you might get a van der Waals clash with a big side chain in the substrate that was really unfavorable. So we think that it's basically 
enough rigidity to be able to, when the subunit moves, to uh, transmit that force to the substrate um, and enough flexibility to accommodate multiple amino acid sequences and translocation and when you're gripping for unfolding. But those, you know, those are guesses basically. So that's interesting because in clip B, we now see large motions of pore loops. Uh, we are just really? writing it up. So that will be interesting to compare. Absolutely. Thank you. So maybe, maybe I'll take the next question. Um, so Bob, I, I was quite surprised by the fact that firing of, of the subunits of clip X uh, is basically looks stochastic. I mean, if you compare, for example, the Groyel, where you have a rather concerted, we have positive cooperativity between the individual subunits. So it, it structurally, um, how can I imagine this liking cooperativity? So are the active centers for ATP hydrolysis so separated that there's basically no communication between the subunits? Well, we know there's subunit communication. We've got lots of experiments and other people have experiments that say that the subunits do communicate with each other. I think it's just that they don't communicate in a way that sort of says, all right, only one, you know, one guy goes first, the next guy goes, then the next guy goes. It's a, sort of, you can imagine a situation where, you know, depending upon the structure that the probability of hydrolysis in subunit A is 30% and then subunit B is 15% and in subunit C it's 10%, et cetera. Um, and so when we go in and we inactivate something, we're looking at, you know, something else uh, going on. Um, it's, you know, but, and so the ATP hydrolysis basically works then like a, like a thresholding mechanism. You consume one, two, three, four ATP until you get to the, to the force required to translocate. That's basically. No, it. no, no, I, we're, we're for translocation. One ATP hydrolysis event moves the substrate. We think five to seven residues. Um, so there's no thresholding there. If, if there was, you know, if you needed four hydrolysis events, for example, to unfold. Um, because, you know, the first one made the protein a little weaker and then a little weaker still, and the fourth one actually unfolded. You get some sort of gamma distribution of dwell times. Right, right. And you don't get that. The, the exactly. dwell times are basically exponentially distributed. And, you know, for translocation and for unfolding of weak substrates, we can really count that, you know, we're getting an unfolding event with one ATP hydrolysis event or a translocation event with one hydrolysis event. We can't be 100% sure of that because you never know that what you're measuring in bulk is the same as what you're measuring in single molecule. But if you make that assumption, it's, it's pretty clearly the case. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So next question is by Jessica Swanson. Yes. Hi, Bob. Beautiful talk. Hi. Others. Um, so we just started modeling um, and simulations of other ATPs, is not Clipex yet, but it's really, it's nice to see all the, the biophysical data you've collected on this and, and really fascinating results, right, that don't make complete sense. Um, so I have about a billion questions, so I'll just ask one. Um, what do you think about the relationship between the hydrolysis and the interaction with the peptide? How um, is hydrolysis? And of course you have not just hydrolysis, right? We always talk about hydrolysis. You're also going to have the release of the, the phosphate, release of the ADP, release of the magnesium, binding of the ATPs, all these things. Yeah, How so, is that interaction with the peptide? So the answer is we have no idea. So, I mean, we don't really have a good idea what, you know, the, is the power stroke occur, you know, at what step in the hydrolysis cycle? We just don't know. Um, and as I suggested, you know, with, with these bursts of power strokes, presumably, you know, you're waiting to get a burst of power strokes until you've had multiple hydrolysis events. Um, and so that's going to be different as well. So that's, an ex you know, that's something I'd love to know, but we don't have the tools right now to make it really clear whether it's product release. I don't think it's nucleotide binding, but I can't rigorously rule that out that sets off the power stroke. And as you know, if you pick your favorite molecular machine, they, the power strokes go by all sorts of different mechanisms, depending on what the machine is and what it's, what it's doing. So we, we, we're not there yet for Clip XP. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, so next question by Rafael Petrosian. Uh, yeah, thank you for a very interesting talk. So my question is how much force is applied by CLAPEX for uh, translocation 
and will that force be depending on the sequence which is being translocated? Uh, was, was it possible to measure this in optical trapping experiments? Well, what we know is that clip X in the optical trap can work against forces of 20 to 25 picanewtons. So, you know, it, the, whatever the stall force it is, is it's bigger than that. And, you know, again, if you move, let's say, uh, one nanometer against 20 picanewtons, that's using about half of the, of the free energy of ATP hydrolysis, uh, recovering about half of that. So that's, that's, you know, sort of makes sense. During translocation, you're not, you know, during translocation, the poly, the, the proteins unfolded. So you're really not working against any forces there other than the usual forces of molecular friction. Um, but it's really the unfolding that 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 requires, I think, the the serious application of force and 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 the reasonable level of grip. Um, I see. Thank you. Okay, so next question by Michael Hecht. Uh, okay, can you hear me? I can. Yeah. yeah okay. Well, hello, Bob. I think I. Hey, okay, I think I first started asking you questions about forty years ago. So here's the question for today. Um, so I was really struck by this uh, symmetry mismatch between six and seven. Yep. And you showed us, you know, pretty clearly how the system manages to accommodate that. But that that got me thinking, you know, yes, the system can accommodate that symmetry mismatch, but why would evolution have selected for that symmetry mismatch? And so that leads me to ask, is there some advantage to having that kind of a symmetry mismatch that would have been favorable relative to having uh, an actual match? Any thoughts on that? Well, I wasn't there when these things evolved, so I can't <laughs> directly answer your question, but I think we all give evolution too much credit. Um, evolution does what works, right? And if smashing together a, a six and a seven works, there's no real selective advantage to, to going anywhere else. So the, the interesting point is the proteasome is also a six, seven mismatch, but there's a bacterial homologue of the proteasome called HSLUV in which it's a six, six match. And in some AAA proteases, the um, AAA domain is actually covalently coupled to the peptidase domain. So again, those are six, six matches. So I don't think there's anything really important about the six, seven mismatch. Um, it may have small effects, but beyond that, I, I don't think we can really address that question. Okay. Okay, so next question is by um, Dudu Tong. Would you like to unmute yourself and uh, ask your question? Hey, can you hear me? So uh, thanks for, for your nice talk. So I have a question about the models to explain the peptide translocation. Uh, yep. so, so you talk about the, the, the widely accepted model, the sequential model that translocated uh, two, peptide, uh, two residues per ATP hydrolysis. And yep. in our case, actually, the clip XP does not satisfy this model. So you propose a model that uh, each ATP hydrolysis will translo translate, uh, translocate uh, six residues. So by comparing these two models, I, uh, my understanding is like in the model that uh, translocate two, uh, two residues per ATP hydrolysis, we can, uh, we can think the five subunits that, that does not undergo ATP hydrolysis that grips the peptide. And in your model, that actually the one subunit undergo ATP hydrolysis is a grip point of the uh, of the peptide. However, uh, I think usually the, the the subunit undergoes ATP hydrolysis will have a pretty large conformational change. And also in your 2020 paper, uh, it, you also mentioned that the the subunit and AT, ABP will will be less stable and uh, probably will have weaker. Uh, contact with the uh, substrate peptide. So why do you think the, the, the weaker uh, interaction for the subunit undergoes ATP hydrolysis can act as a, as a grip point uh, that can drag the whole uh, peptide uh, during the trans uh, peptide translocation? Yeah, I think, 
I think there's a couple of of, of answers to, to to your question. One is, you know, we don't know which structures, and I don't think anybody knows which structures are actually gripping struct. You know, in any of these models, you need a reset uh, things. And so, for example, the structures in which we see five poor loops interacting with a polypeptide could be a structure waiting to reset for the next power stroke. Um, also, I mean, ATP hydrolysis, we think anywhere, I mean, because again, the only real flexibility in a hexamer comes from the hinge, the, the linker between the large and small uh, AAA domains. Um, hydrolysis in any subunit is going to change the conformation of the entire ring. They, these sub, you know, there's no model in which one subunit is moving independently of the other. That's, you know, that's probably just not there. So, you know, the models that we're proposing basically don't answer all of the questions, but they're at least they're consistent with our structures and with the biochemical evidence. And I don't really know of any biochemical evidence that really supports the two amino acid translocation model yet. Um, there may be things out there I haven't seen yet, but, uh, but again, I'm not suggesting our models are right, but I do suggest that any model that is going to be right in the, at the end of the day has to account for the fact that you know you, these machines work with only a few active subunits and that they seem to move things in much bigger chunks uh, than the two, the two residue model would suggest. Yeah, okay, thank you so much. So the, the next and uh, probably last question is by um, Iker Soto Santariaga. Iker, can you please unmute yourself? Yeah, uh, well, first I'd like to thank you, Dr. Sauer. It was a really interesting talk. Uh, my question is related to the Clipex P complex. Uh, I guess I was just wondering, is docking between the Clipex and the Clip P complexes affect features like either translocation, binding, or substrate grip? Or is it all the same when Clipex is alone or docked to Clip P? So it's a great question. Uh... Clip X works without Clip P, so it will unfold and translocate without Clip P. It works a little better and it can apply a little bit more force when it's bound to Clip P. So there's something about the complex that allows Clip X to be a little bit more efficient, more effective, um, but in the absence of, of Clip P, it'll still unfold, it'll still translocate, just not again, against quite as much force, let's say. Thank you. Okay, so I hope I didn't scare anybody away by, by saying probably the last question, but there are in fact no questions left in the chat bar. <laughs> um, and so I think uh, it's time to thank you, Bob, for, uh, for the wonderful talk and the, the great presentation and beautiful data. And thanks all of you for listening. And I hope uh, we see each other again in two weeks uh, for TechChip Haas talk. Um, and so with that, have a great day or great evening, wherever you are. Thank you all. Thanks so much, Paul. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.